What's the biggest villain in the world of weight loss? Carbs. Is butter a carb? In today's world of weight loss, everybody's telling us that we must ditch carb, go low carb, and we will lose weight effortlessly. It is! It really is! Even oats are on the chopping block and freshly baked bread should be a distant memory. But hold your horses. What if we actually like our bread, pasta, and potatoes? Can we eat carbs and still lose weight? I need to know! Hello, my dears, and welcome. I'm Arina, a registered dietitian with a passion for guiding others on their weight loss journeys. Having lost 80 pounds myself, I had a lot of questions about weight loss and carbs, and today I'm answering them all. Do we actually need carbs? And what for? What type of carbs should we eat and how much? Are carbs really the enemy of weight loss? What's the difference between white and whole grain bread? But most importantly, can you eat carbs and still lose weight? Let's get into it. Carbohydrates are one of the three macronutrients in the human diet alongside protein and fat. They encompass a wide range of foods, including fruits, non-starchy and starchy vegetables, legumes, grains, cereals, and sugars. Their primary function in the body is to serve as the main energy source. One gram of carbs provides us with four calories. When consumed, carbohydrates are broken down into glucose, which enters the bloodstream and is utilized by cells to produce ATP the energy currency of the body. While cells can use both carbohydrates and fats for energy production, carbohydrates are typically preferred, especially when available in the diet. Our body uses glucose from carbs to fuel all the cells in the body, including muscles, heart, lungs, and brain. Notably, the brain relies heavily on glucose, using between 20 and 25% of the glucose our body needs. It likes glucose so much that even in the absence of dietary carbs, our body can still produce glucose from other sources such as fats and proteins. Carbohydrates play a vital role in blood glucose and insulin metabolism. They also participate in cholesterol and triglyceride metabolism and act as energy reserves. When we eat carbs and the immediate energy needs for glucose are met, the excess glucose is stored as glycogen. Glycogen serves as stored energy primarily in the liver and muscles. Liver glycogen helps maintain normal blood sugar levels between meals, while muscle glycogen is crucial for that high-intensity exercise. If glycogen stores are full and energy needs are met, excess carbs can be then converted into triglyceride and stored as fat. This process is facilitated by insulin. Insulin is a hormone responsible for regulating blood sugar levels, but it also facilitates the storage of excess carbohydrates as fat. This process is part of the prevailing belief known as the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, which suggests that high insulin levels hinder fat loss as insulin is so-called storage hormone. But this theory has been debunked by research many times because when it comes to weight loss, calorie intake will determine the end result and not the insulin in healthy people. Topic for another debate. Additionally, carbohydrates provide essential vitamins, minerals, dietary fiber, and phytonutrients necessary for overall health support. But although carbs have all those roles, the question still arises. Do we actually need them to survive? Survival. We often hear that carbohydrates are not essential nutrients. Well, technically, this is true. Wait, Wait what? what? Our body possesses alternative mechanisms to fulfill its energy needs in the absence of carbs. Nearly every cell in the body has the capability to produce ATP, the primary energy molecule, from fat. 
While the brain typically relies heavily on glucose for fuel, it can adapt really good to other source of energy coming from fat called ketones. During extended periods of starvation or very low carb and ketogenic diets, ketone bodies are formed from the breakdown of fatty acids and they serve as an alternative energy source when carbs are limited. In this scenario, the body is in the state of ketosis. Not the same as ketoacidosis, which is a serious complication of uncontrolled diabetes. But even in ketosis, the brain and some other cells still require a portion of its energy from glucose obtained through muscle breakdown and other internal sources. By utilizing ketones instead of glucose, the brain significantly reduces the need for muscle breakdown to produce glucose, which is a crucial adaptation that enables humans to survive longer periods without food. Now, should we all go low carb as we don't need carbs? Not really, as we do need vitamins, minerals, and dietary fibers, which could be lacking on a diet that severely restrict carbohydrates. A prospective cohort study and meta-analysis by Stillman and colleagues showed that having moderate amounts of carbs in the diet is favorable. Too high or too low percentages of carbohydrates in the diet were associated with increased mortality with minimal risk observed at 50 to 55% carbohydrate intake. They further conclude that low-carbohydrate dietary patterns favoring animal-derived protein and fat sources were associated with higher mortality, whereas those that favored plant-derived proteins and fat intake were associated with lower mortality. Additionally, suggesting that the source of food notably modifies the association between carbohydrate intake and mortality. Furthermore, carbs such as fruit, vegetable, legumes, grain, etc. are the only primary source of dietary fiber. And we do know that a higher dietary fiber intake is associated with a reduced risk of death, reduced risk of coronary heart disease, certain type of cancers, especially colon cancer. And let's not forget about recreational and professional athletes and their essential need for carbohydrates as a key component of the diet. While carbohydrates may not be essential in the strictest sense, their inclusion in the diet supports optimal nutrition and ensures a well-rounded intake of essential nutrients. But the evidence shows that the quality of the carbohydrates consumed determines cardiometabolic health. So, it is important to distinguish between the types of carbs we eat more often and those we eat less. High intakes of dietary fiber from veggies, fruit, and whole grains are associated with positive effects on health, while diets high in simple sugars and refined carbohydrates can have negative effects on cardiometabolic health. Let's look at the types of carbs. There are several different forms of carbohydrates, from more simpler ones to more complex ones. Carbs can be divided into categories based on the number of single sugar or monosaccharide units. Categories include sugars, starches, and fibers. Sugars would be more simple type of carbs and starches and fiber more complex type of carbs. Simple carbohydrates or sugars are metabolized faster, they are absorbed into the bloodstream more quickly, so they are a quick energy source. But often they have less fibers and micronutrients and are not as filling, which is important for weight loss success. Complex carbohydrates, on the other hand, are metabolized slower, providing a sustained release of energy and promoting feelings of fullness as they usually contain more fibers and other micronutrients. These categories, of course, are not mutually exclusive as carbohydrate foods can contain a combination of all of those types such as sugar, starches and fiber. For instance, fruit like bananas provide a mix of simple sugars, starches, and dietary fiber. 
Similarly, whole grains such as oats and quinoa offer a blend of starches and fiber, contributing to their nutritional value and health benefits. Now let's dive deep into simple carbs. Simple carbohydrates or sugars that are most common found in foods are glucose, fructose, galactose, lactose and sucrose. But some are naturally occurring and others are added. In foods such as fruit, honey, 100% fruit juices, some vegetables, milk and dairy products, we find naturally occurring sugars. Those foods are so-called whole foods as they are packed with other nutrients such as vitamins, minerals, fibers and water and are a part of a healthy diet. When eating a whole fruit, it's almost impossible to consume too much simple sugars to cause harm. On the other side are added sugars. Added sugars are sugars and syrups that are added to food or beverages when they are processed or prepared. They have many different names such as sucrose, which is basic table sugar, corn syrup, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, maltose, etc. Major source of added sugars are foods such as sugary beverages, energy and fruit drinks, candy, desserts, sweet snacks, sugary breakfast cereals, ice cream, cookies, you know the goodies. I mean some goody goodies. <laughs> But for some of those foods we mentioned, the story is not solely about sugar. Foods such as cakes, cookies, ice cream, chocolate, etc. are not just a carbohydrate source, but also a fat source, where around half or more of the total calories from those foods are coming from fats and not sugar. Those foods are energy-dense foods, meaning they contain a large number of calories in a small portion. They are also highly delicious as sugar and fat is magic combo and easy to overeat. So when we decrease those foods with the aim of excluding added sugars from a diet, we essentially decrease calorie intake and that's why we lose weight and not because we canceled sugar. A systematic review and meta-analysis of 68 studies on sugar intake and body weight demonstrated that when the amount of sugar consumed is replaced with an equal amount of other carbohydrates but keeping the total energy intake the same, there is no significant association with changes in body weight. And if sugar was to blame, those people would lose weight, but they didn't. And the athletes would be fat, but they are not. The problem is that foods that contain sugar are, again, energy-dense foods, easy to overeat, and when we overeat and overshoot our calories, we gain weight. A significant number of people who regularly consume sugary foods and sugar-sweetened beverages fail to reduce their calorie intake from other sources, leading to weight gain. And another fact, it's not about good versus bad foods or good versus bad carbs. Because one single food that makes us fat doesn't exist. You know the saying, eating one salad won't result in weight loss, same as eating one cookie won't in weight gain. It's about dietary patterns over long term, and yes, dietary patterns high in free sugars, but also high in saturated fats, are associated with obesity. And guess which foods are part of that pattern and how hard it is to eat them in moderation. Now back to the added sugar. Should we just eat it in unlimited amounts without any thought? Of course not. Too much simple sugars in a diet is not advisable. The World Health Organization's new guidelines recommend reduced intake of free sugars to less than 10% of total energy intake. A further reduction to below 5% of total energy intake would provide additional health benefits. The American Heart Association agrees and recommends limiting added sugars to no more than 6% of calories each day. 
For most women, that's no more than 100 calories per day or about 60 spoons of added sugar. And for men, it's about 150 calories per day or about 9 teaspoons. So, when we eat foods with naturally occurring simple sugars such as fruit, yogurt, maybe some honey, we are probably halfway there. If we on top of that add some ice cream and a cup of soda, we are done for the day. So, for a simple carbs recommendation, we could conclude. Eat your fruits and veggies as they are low in calories and high in fiber, micronutrients and water and therefore satiating, which is helpful on a weight loss journey. The percentage of US adults meeting fruit and vegetable intake recommendation is really low. Dietary guidelines for Americans advise consuming one and a half to two cup equivalents of fruit and two to three cup equivalents of vegetables daily. European food-based dietary guidelines offer similar recommendation to aim for at least five servings of vegetables and fruits a day. So, five a day. By the way, no same person ever would think that there is a link between obesity and bananas. So enjoy them and you are welcome. Well, I love banana cream sandwiches. Let me know in the comments what's your favorite fruit. Also, you can enjoy some protein-rich Greek yogurt with a teaspoon of honey. It's important to be mindful of sugary-rich foods with added sugars as they are usually calorically dense. You can have them, but in moderate portions and probably less often. Think of one donut every three or four days and not three in one. As for sugary sweetened beverages, they are a problem, especially among our youth, as they really like to drink them. They are energy dense, meaning high in calories, have no nutritional value, are not satiating, but can really add up to overall caloric intake. So intake of sugary beverages can be a part of the obesity story, but it's not the sole cause of the problem, as obesity is multifactorial disease. I advise skipping on the beverages as those calories can really add up ruining your deficit. Yes, regular or mineral water and unsweetened tea is the best choice for hydration, but if you really enjoy your drinks, you can opt for diet sodas. They contain zero calories and no sugar. And no, artificial sweeteners won't kill you the same as artificial intelligence won't. Probably. They will absolutely kill us. Anyway, moving on to complex carbs. Complex carbohydrates contain a large number of glucose molecules. Examples of complex carbohydrates most common in foods are starches and fiber. Most starches are broken down into sugars by digestive enzymes in the body and used for energy. On the other hand, Fibers cannot be broken down for energy extraction, but instead they pass relatively intact into large intestine. There, fiber can be fermented by the colonic microflora or it can pass through the large intestine and bind water, increasing stool weight. Greater intake of dietary fiber has been associated with increased post-meal satiety and decrease hunger and that can really add to weight loss efforts. And fibers is mostly carbs game. Complex carbs are found in many foods including vegetables, legumes and grains. Legumes such as beans, lentils, chickpeas, soybeans and others are also a great plant-based source of protein so you get a lot for your buck. Next, there are grains. Most commonly consumed grains include wheat, rice, corn, oats, barley, rye, buckwheat, quinoa and many others, with wheat and rice accounting for more than a half of worldwide grain production. But when it comes to grains, we have two parts of the story, whole grains and refined grains. Whole grains contain the entire grain which is made of brawn, germ and endosperm. 
They are generally low in saturated fat and high in dietary fiber, vitamins, especially B vitamins, minerals, and a wide range of phytochemicals that have been associated with improved long-term health. Examples include whole wheat flours and products made out of them, such as whole grain pasta and breads, oats, brown rice, wild rice, bran cereal, quinoa, barley, etc. On the other hand, there are refined grains. Refined grains have been milled in a way that removes the bread and the germ. This gives them a finer texture and improves their shelf life, but also a higher starch content than the whole grains. But the process of refining leaves them with less dietary fiber and lower levels of vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, and phytochemicals. Now, refined grains are often enriched, which means some of the B vitamins and iron are added back in after processing. While that's good, fiber might not be added back. Examples of refined grains include white flour and products such as regular white pasta, bread, white rice, corn grits, some breakfast cereals with extra added sugars, and of course crackers, pastries, and other goodies. Refined carbohydrates tend to cause more rapid and larger increases in levels of blood glucose and insulin than do whole grain products. Because of their intact physical form with higher content of fiber, whole grains are digested and absorbed more slowly than refined and they typically have lower GI values which can all aid to your weight loss efforts. The high fiber content of most whole grain foods may help prevent weight gain by increasing appetite control throughout delaying carbohydrate absorption and higher intake of whole grains instead of refined ones can help with weight loss. And when you pair whole grains, lean proteins, vegetables and moderate amounts of unsaturated fats, you have a winning weight loss combo. That's good stuff. Think whole grain bread sandwich with grilled chicken, tomato, and a pinch of olive oil. Is this for real? Like for real, for real? Yes, I said bread. To clarify further on the bread, white bread or pasta and whole grain bread or pasta do not differ in calorie content. They differ in nutrient content such as fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Those fibers help with satiety and it's easier to overeat fluffy white bread than whole grain version. But gram for gram, calories are the same. So if you like your white bread and white pasta, you can have it, but try to add other sources of fiber to your meals such as vegetables to improve composition of your meal. What kind of bread you like the most? Share in the comments. You know, for the algorithm. Sometimes we think that certain foods such as bread or pasta are the ones to blame for weight problem, but it's not one certain food. The truth is no food by itself makes you fat or makes you lose weight independent of the whole day's energy intake and energy intake over long term. 100 grams of white or whole grain bread has around 250 calories and 100 grams of uncooked pasta around 380. Where are then those other calories? They are in the mayo and full fat cheese we put on the bread or maybe it was Nutella spread. They are in butter mixed in our pasta creamy sauce and in parmesan not so gently sprinkled over our tortellini. And again, Neither of mentioned foods are problem by itself. We need to look at our overall dietary habits and practice portion control. Portion control is important regardless of the carbohydrate source. You can use healthy plate model for portion guidance. Fill half of your plate with non-starchy vegetables, one quarter with lean protein sources, and the remaining quarter with whole grains or starchy vegetables, while you get your fat from cooking oil or fatty fish, or with a sprinkle of Parmesan cheese. So yes, don't be afraid of whole grains. Whole grains are key components of healthy eating patterns. For a complex carb recommendation, we could conclude. 
It's advisable to select foods high in dietary fiber, including whole grain breads and cereals, legumes, vegetables and fruits whenever is possible and practice portion control. Because it is totally possible to eat a 100% whole food diet and not lose weight if you don't achieve calorie deficit. Now all of that doesn't mean we can't enjoy some regular white pasta or freshly baked white bread, but again, portion control and when enjoying more refined carbs, try to add some extra fibers such as fruit or vegetables and do not forget about protein. This combo will help you with moderation and satiety. Now we decided on the best sources of carbs, but how much of them per day? In its 2010 report, the Institute of Medicine established an RDA for carbohydrates of 130 grams per day for adults and children aged over 1. This value is based on the number of sugar and starches required to provide the brain with an adequate supply of glucose. The IOM set an acceptable macronutrient distribution range for carbohydrates of 45 to 65% of total calories, equating to about 200 to 300 grams per day. These proportions provide a range broad enough to cover the needs for most active individuals, but specific carbohydrate recommendations are typically made based on gram per kilogram body weight formula. These ranges are from 3 to 12 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight, depending on the level of physical activity. Honestly, most of us with sedentary lifestyles can forget about higher range of those numbers as they are reserved for professional athletes. But with some extra walking, we can be quite comfortable at 2 to 3 grams of carb per kilogram a day, which is about 200 to 250 grams of carbs per day for an 80 kilogram person. If you exercise a couple of hours per week, those numbers could go nicely up to 4 or 5 grams per kilogram a day. More active, more carbs, less active, less carbs, even with the same goal, which is weight loss. Now, don't stress about grams of carbs per day, just have in mind those 40-50% of total daily calories. Fiber is also an important carbohydrate, as it's found to reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, stroke and digestive issue. World Health Organization and EFSA and other organizations recommend an average daily intake of 25 to 30 grams of fiber per adult. If you want to lose weight, you'll need to follow a diet with a calorie deficit, but inside that calorie budget, there is a place for carbohydrates as they are a part of a healthy diet. For example, if we follow 1,800 calorie diet and 50% of those calories come from carbs, that's about 220 grams of carbs per day. And if you have like a slice of bread that weighs about 50 grams, that's around 110 calories or just 20 grams of carbs. So let's see in the comments who has a hunch what the verdict will be. And now let's look at the real deal weight loss and low carb diets. We're not eating. We're on a diet. When aiming to lose weight, achieving a calorie deficit is essential. This means consuming fewer calories than our body needs throughout the day. For instance, an average adult may require 2000 to 2500 calories daily for weight maintenance. To create a deficit, we typically aim for a reduction of around 10 to 20%, which equates to 300 to 500 fewer calories per day. Now let's consider a scenario where our daily deficit is 1,800 calories. These calories come from three nutrient sources, protein with 4 calories per gram, fat with 9 calories per gram, and carbohydrates with 4 calories per gram. Because we lowered calories, we will need to lower some of these three nutrients. Well, protein intake is not the one to be lowered. Protein is crucial for preserving muscle mass and promoting satiety during weight loss, so instead of lowering it, it is wise to increase it. Next, 
we are left with fats and carbs. We can choose to lower fat intake while keeping carb intake higher or vice versa, or we can make moderate reductions in both nutrients. An analogy might help. Think of your 1,800 calorie budget as money divided into compartments for bills, travels, and clothes. Bills, which is protein intake, are non-negotiable, but you have flexibility with travel, which could be carbs, and clothes, which are fats. Depending on your preferences, you can adjust spending in these two other categories accordingly. For example, if you are a travel enthusiast, you might opt to trim your clothes budget to fund more adventures, much like lowering fat intake to indulge in more carbs. On the other hand, if you are a fashionista who loves dressing up, you might choose to stay home more often to splurge on trendy outfits similar to reducing carb intake to prioritize fats. Let me know in the comments which side are you on. Do you tend to favor lower, higher or moderate carb diets? While some prefer low-carb, high-fat diets and others favor low-fat, high-carb diets, both can be effective for weight loss as long as overall calorie intake is controlled. Research, including meta-analysis and systematic review, suggests that low-carb diets may lead to greater weight loss at the six-month mark compared to low-fat diets. However, this initial advantage diminishes by the 12-month mark with both low-carb and low-fat diets proving equally effective in reducing weight over a one-year period. Another randomized clinical trial, DietFits, came to the same conclusion. No significant difference in weight change among overweight adults between a healthy low-fat diet versus a healthy low-carbohydrate diet. While low-carb diets can slightly outperform low-fat diets in the short term, there are no significant differences between the two in the long term. And the long term is the name of the game. All right, it's going to be a long journey, everyone. Further exploration reveals that when calories and protein intake are equated, there is no significant difference in the weight loss between these dietary approaches. And for additional fun fact, in 2010, professor of human nutrition Sir Mark Hope went on so-called convenience store Twinkie diet to demonstrate that weight loss is purely down to calorie deficit. He ate 1,800 calories a day, where two-thirds of his food intake came from junk foods, which are high in carbs and fats. And what do you think? Did he lose the weight? Of course, eating mostly Twinkies, donuts, and other energy-dense foods lacking in micronutrients and fiber is not sustainable or healthy, but he did prove a point. Staying in calorie deficit will result in weight loss regardless of the macronutrient composition of your diet as calorie restriction is the primary driver of weight loss. What do you think? What will the verdict be? To eat bread or not to eat bread? Well, I'm not eating bread now. I'm off bread. So, in terms of nutrients, to avoid losing muscle mass, it's important to keep your protein intake high, but the distribution of fats and carbs is purely up for individual debate based on your food preferences. If you enjoy carbs, you don't have to exclude them from your diet and avoid bread and pasta. However, it's essential to practice portion control and choose nutrient-dense carbohydrate options rich in fiber, vitamins, and minerals to optimize nutritional value. And there you have it, my dears. As we learned today that we can have bread, pasta, potatoes, and other carb foods to lose weight, we will wrap this video up and unwrap this bread and enjoy it in moderation with some lean proteins and veggies. Remember, there is no one-size-fits-all diet for achieving sustained weight loss, and if you like your carbs, you can eat them and lose weight at the same time. As we said, portion control, whole foods, whole grains, lots of veggies and some fruit, but the most important determinants of your success 
adherence to plan you choose for yourself, along with patience and consistency. If you want to thank me for permission to have your pasta, you can do that in the comments below. And if you like the video, please hit the button and subscribe to the channel. It's very appreciated. Thank you again, my dears, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.